I didn't want him to stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I guess we should uh, we should move ahead. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to talk about the ethics of climate change a little bit. Uh, the ethics of climate change uh, has to do first uh, with uh, uh, why does climate change matter? What, what is at stake with climate change? And here I think we're going to have a lot of overlap between the talk we just had and the sort of things I want to say about that. So you use the microphone? Is it on? No. If you want to uh, use the... Uh, I don't want to use that one. I want to use <laughs> You're too <Yeah>. tall. <laughs> How about now? Uh, How about now? No. No. <laughs> How about now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ethics of climate change, uh, which has to do first with why climate change matters. So what, it, what is at stake uh, with climate change? Um, and then secondly, it has to do with uh, uh, how we ought to respond to climate change. How, what, we ought, what, ought to be, what ought we to do in response to the challenges that are posed by um, high global climate change? Um, those aren't small topics. Uh, so I'm going to restrict myself to trying to make three uh, sort of central points um, about, uh, about the nature of the problem and what we ought to do about it. And here are the points that I'm going to try to articulate and motivate a little bit. Uh, the first point. Uh, is that um, global climate change is primarily an ethical problem. <coughs> it's not just a technical problem or an economic problem or a scientific problem. Um, that once we get clear on what's at stake, uh, what values are at stake with global climate change, we'll see that we actually have an ethical responsibility uh, to address it. And this is important because seeing the problem this way has implications uh, for the urgency with which we should address it, and the resources that we ought to be willing to commit to addressing it. Though, after the previous talk, I don't know how much urgency we did. Fine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the second point that I want to uh, try to motivate and articulate is um, that any ethically acceptable approach to addressing climate change um, is going to have to involve immediate aggressive greenhouse gas emissions mitigation. And again, I think this just follows right off the talk we just had, the idea of irreversibility. But also, I want to emphasize that the nature of the values that are at stake, the nature of the impacts, are such that um, there are wrongs and harms that we can't undo. Okay, so it's not just that the climate system can't go back, but that the, the, the harms and wrongs that are involved um, are things that we can't make up for later. And the third uh, key point that I want to make about the ethics of climate change um, is that the level of mitigation that we need is not likely to be accomplished through uh, technological innovation alone. Um, technological innovation is going to be crucial. We need to look for inexpensive, abundant, low emissions, wide use uh, uh, energies and efficiencies. Um, but we're also going to have to look at behavioral and cultural adaptations as well, or changes as well, mitigation strategies as well. Um, and this means looking at population which is one of the things that was emphasized before, and also looking at consumption and consumptive patterns and behaviors. Okay. So, um, so these are the three ideas that I want to try to uh, put forward, and I'll be very interested to hear what you think about. So to start, um, I want to highlight just a few things about, um, uh, about the situation, about the science, about a little bit about the politics as background to try and understand what's at stake. Um, so this is uh, uh, a graphic of possible future emission scenarios. Okay, the, um, uh, the business as usual scenario is the emission scenario if we continue emitting at the trajectory that we're currently on. Um, the confirmed proposals scenarios are future emission scenarios that we would be on if um, um, countries met the targets for emissions reduction set under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Okay, so Countries have made these commitments in this international forum. If they actually try to do it and they succeed, that's the confirmed proposals trajectory. Uh, the potential proposals trajectory is the trajectory we'd be on um, if the sorts of proposals that are being talked about in that framework were uh, actually committed to, but they haven't been committed to in any way, and then were accomplished. And then the low emissions trajectory 
uh, is the emissions trajectory um, that uh, the countries that are part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change says is their goal. <laughs> All right, that's the trajectory where um, increases in global mean surface air temperature are limited to two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Um, um, and you can see, obviously, how far that is from um, what they're actually committed to at this point, let alone the business as usual scenario. All right, so here are the, here are the takeaways I want to, uh, 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 here are the things I want to take away from this um, graphic going forward from this talk. The first is that um, these are very high rates of change. So on the business as usual scenario, for example, um, the uh, expected increase in global mean surface air temperature would be between 5.3 and 14.3 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Uh, the middle of that is 8.9 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the um, difference in the uh, average surface air temperature between Burlington, Vermont, and Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, you may have heard of Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> it doesn't snow there often, right? That's enormously climactic. Significant. And this is also climatically significant. The difference between Boston, Massachusetts, and Louisville, Kentucky is about 4.8 degrees Fahrenheit. This was in the early 2000s. Um, so, uh, so even on the low scenario, we're looking at high rates of change. As we go up to these scenarios, enormous rates of change. Um, the other thing is to notice is the variance. There's a huge range of possible climatic futures here. All right. So. Um, the distinctive features of climate change, for what I, I want to uh, talk about what follows, is that we're looking at very high rates of change, uh, very rapid, <coughs> with very large amounts of uncertainty and unpredictability. And this makes cultural and biological adaptation to those changes more difficult. Right? There's always been climate change, climactic change. There's always been ecological change. Uh, societies have always had to adapt. Species populations have always had to adapt. Uh, but the faster the change, the higher the magnitude of the change, the more difficult it is to adapt. And it's the failure of species and human societies to meet that challenge of adaptation that leads to the impact that we're concerned about with global climate change. Uh, so what are these impacts? Uh, let's start with uh, non-human species. So according to the International Union of the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, um, 35% of bird species, 52% of amphibian species, and 71% of coral species uh, have traits that put them at increased risk of extinction due to global climate change. Um, these are traits like not migrating quickly, so not being able to keep up with uh, ecological shifts, um, being geographically bounded, so high mountain alpine species, right? Eventually they run out of mountain. Freshwater lake species, Arctic species, um, island species that are geographically bounded. Species that depend on very particular environmental conditions or narrow ranges of environmental conditions. This is the case with many corals. They're highly sensitive to ocean pH and ocean temperatures and things like that. Uh, so when you take all these sort of features into account, that's an enormous percentage of, uh, at least within those areas, of the, of the species on Earth that are what we call climate risk species. And a study in 2004 found that on the mid-level emission scenarios, uh, that is lower than the confirmed proposal scenarios, um, 15 to 37 percent of species are likely to be committed to extinction by 2050, so just in a matter of decades. Uh, and then according to the IPCC in 2007, um, they concluded that 20 to 30 percent of species are likely to be at increased risk of extinction on lower level scenarios, but as we get to those upper level scenarios, um, there's a possibility of 40 to 70 percent um, extinction rates. Um, so to put this in some context, uh, the background or historical extinction rate, as calculated by the fossil record through the fossil record, is one species per million per year. That's 0.0001 percent. Okay. We're already a bit higher than that because of habitat loss, extraction. Uh, pollution, such things. Um, but this is orders of magnitude increases in species losses um, from what's normal or from where we are now. So that's fun. All right, what about um, effects on people? 
Um, according to the IPCC, uh, climate change will impact the health and welfare of hundreds of millions of people, um, particularly those with low adaptive capacity. So low adaptive capacity is the global poor, people who have less resources to adapt, and people who are more exposed to environmental hazards. Um, How is it going to do this? Uh, food insecurity associated with droughts, um, changes in precipitation patterns, uh, extreme weather events like heat waves, um, storms, floods, uh, spread of pathogens and diseases associated with shifting ecological conditions, and displacement and conflict over resources. So displacement means um, people who have to move uh, because where they live no longer produces enough food, or because of sea level rise, or because of um, 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 extreme weather events and so on. Right? And then as they move, you get a lot of people on the move and you get conflict over resources. Um, this isn't just the future. So already, uh, it's estimated that global climate change is implicated in 300,000, missing zero there, deaths per year. Um, by its, uh, in virtue of the, its contribution to extreme weather events and um, food insecurity and such things. Um, and to have contributed to, the, there's over 20 million environmental refugees, that is people who have uh, become refugees or had to move because of the ecological conditions where they live can no longer support that. All right, so now uh, I think we're in a position to see what's sort of at stake ethically with global climate change, especially when we think about how important it is to get on those lower emission trajectories compared to the upper emissions trajectories. So first, human well-being, right? There's gonna be a tremendous amount of suffering and um, uh, insecurity associated with global climate change. The lower the trajectory we're on, the less of that there is, right? So just from a strictly compassionate humanitarian point of view, the lower trajectory we see. Better. Um, but there's another dimension to this, an additional dimension to this from an ethical perspective, which is this. Um, the, the suffering associated with global climate change, the hardship of suffering, uh, associated with global climate change, uh, is caused by other people. Right? So it's the actions of countries that are emitting high amounts of greenhouse gas emissions that are causing these hardships. And what's worse, from an ethical perspective, knowingly so. Okay. Um, so if we think that people have a right to uh, security, to health, to life, um, and that right includes having other people not act in ways that make it difficult for them to meet those needs, um, then it seems like we have a human rights situation too. Um, and that's quite a strong ethical claim on the need to address uh, this issue. There's also a justice dimension. It just keeps getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> there's how many more, but it's, um, okay, there's also a, a justice dimension. Uh, the justice dimension is that um, those who are most exposed to the hazards of climate change are people who are globally poor, poor, the people that are live closest, uh, are, are most dependent on stable ecological conditions and have the least resources to adapt. Um, but those are the people who are least responsible for global climate change. And they're least responsible because they have lower levels of consumption, so lower levels of energy use, so lower greenhouse gas emissions. Whereas those who are most responsible for global climate change are the high consuming countries high-consuming people, right, who actually have the most adaptive capacity, they're least exposed to the hazards. So uh, we don't have to get too much into theories of justice, right? We don't have to decide whether it's libertarianism or liberalism or conservative theories of justice. Uh, here's a basic principle of justice. Um, those who get the benefits should shoulder the burdens, right? That's generally agreed upon. Um, and this violates that in a pretty massive way. So you have a, a group of people who are enjoying the benefits of high consumption. Right? There's hazards associated with that that fall disproportionately on people who do not enjoy those benefits and have not consented to those hazards. So that's the global justice dimension of climate change. There's also an intergenerational justice dimension, hence the pictures of the babies. Uh, Future generations, right? So, so what we learned in the previous talk is that it's very likely as these feedback mechanisms kick in, 
right? That the future climate could be well much worse than the present climate. The things that we're doing now are going to have legacies into the future. But of course, these emissions now are benefiting us. We enjoy the high emissions, the things that come with high emission lifestyles. Um, but future generations don't because they're not. I mean, they're, they don't exist, right? So um, we're passing on the cost to the future um, for benefits to ourselves. So that's the intergenerational justice dimension. You, ask, you add to that uh, the loss in biodiversity and species, and we have um, what in ethics we call a overdetermined conclusion. <laughs> uh, on uh, harms and um, 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 justice grounds to current people, on harms and justice grounds to future people, and when we look at non-human species, we get the conclusion that global climate change is a serious ethical problem that we need to address. So that's the first, um, first point I wanted to, uh, to make, that it's important that we see the various dimensions and ways in which climate change is an ethical problem so that we can appreciate uh, the importance of addressing it, the urgency of addressing it. Uh, now here's to the second point, which I, in light of the previous talk, uh, almost don't even need to discuss, but, um, but I will. Um, this is that the response needs to involve aggressive immediate mitigation. And uh, here's three reasons why, though I, I think I can add a fourth uh, in my previous talk. The, the first is that unjust harms, which is what we see with climate change, uh, and human rights being compromised are things that ought to be prevented. We, they need to be compensated for when they occur. Or there needs to be restitution when they occur. But it's always ethically preferable for them not to happen in the first place. Moreover, they're not the sorts of things that can be justified um, by appeals to benefits to others. Right? So I can't say to this person over here who I'm doing an injustice to, work with me, uh, that, um, look, I'm sorry that this unjust thing is happening to you, but it's really good for me. I'm sorry that I'm compromising your ability to meet your basic needs and rights, but it would be really inconvenient uh, for me to stop doing it. Right? So human rights, concerns, unjust harms are not the sorts of things that can be traded off for benefits to others, typically. Okay. Um, so that's the first reason why they, they this, the, for the mitigation imperative, that, that the nature of these harms is actually need to be prevented, not um, addressed later on. Okay. Uh, the second reason for the mitigation imperative is that I think when we look at it, the adaptation options are thin. The so adaptation here is, uh, is, is trying to um, uh, adapt ourselves to a climate change planet, right? And, and prevent bad things from happening that way as opposed to mitigating emissions. Okay. And I think there's reasons to not be hugely optimistic about our adaptive capacity, right? Uh, and this means that it's more important, uh, this adds importance to, mitiga to mitigation. So here's some examples. Food security. Already, <coughs> everything I say is <coughs> impressive. Uh, uh, already, 925 million people are undernourished in the world. So already our agricultural systems and our distribution systems and our productive systems aren't up to feeding 7 billion people in a, a planet that is undergoing some climate change now, but not the massive sort of climate change that we'll be looking at in the future. If we add those high trajectories to this, and the sorts of climate change and unpredictability and precipitation, precipitation <coughs> pattern change, these sorts of things, it's going to become even, even harder. So if we don't have the institutions and capacities to do it now, odds are under those conditions with a higher population, it's going to be even more difficult. The same is true of refugees. There's already millions of refugees around the world in camps. We don't have in international institutions or national institution structures that are adequate for trying to help them, for providing aid, for helping them uh, immigrate if necessary, help them return to their countries when possible. Um, the projections for climate refugees are on the order of tens to hundreds of millions of people. If we see, if we see seven, three meters in sea level rise, we're going to see a lot of people living along the coasts in countries, especially less developed countries, who are going to be on the move. Um, and we are we are going to have institutions to deal with this. And the same is true of species extinctions. We don't have any conservation strategies that scale up to 10,000 species per year. 
That's a big zoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? We can seed bake some. People are talking about blood baking other animals, right? So we can clone them later on. Maybe. Um, uh, we can relocate some, but th there, we have no strategies that are going to scale up to deal with these kinds of species losses. Okay, so we don't really have any nice ad adaptation options on the horizon. So I'm thinking uh, mitigation is more important than ever. Um, and here's another uh, consideration of favorite mitigation from a justice perspective. Uh, mitigation is global, whereas adaptation is typically local. So um, you saw what happened to MIT on that picture, right? Did you see what happened in Northeastern? <laughs> okay, so if Harvard builds a really big wall to protect Harvard, no offense, uh, what does it do for Northeastern? Nothing, right? So they're actually, now, if we were to reduce emissions enough so that those levels of rises didn't happen anyways, is it good for Harvard? Yes. Is it good for Northeastern? Yes. Is it good for MIT? Yeah. <laughs> yes, right? Uh, same is true of global emissions, right? Think about coastal cities. If New York spends huge amounts of money at preparing for sea level rises, that's good for New York City, but it doesn't help. Um, low-lying cities and less developed countries around the world. However, if we reduce emissions down that lower trajectory, those mitigation uh, strategies will have a benefit to all those people living in those areas, right, by putting us on the lower sea level rise. Okay. So mitigation is global, adaptation is local. This means the benefits are spread out wider, and it also helps um, people with lower adaptive capacity. Uh, so that's uh, beneficial. And the thing that I would add, in light of the previous um, talk, which is something I hadn't thought as much about, but maybe I should, is that uh, it's irreversible, right? There's the, the no going back, right? So this isn't the kind of thing where it's going to be really bad for a while, but we'll get our stuff together and eventually we'll get back on track. These feedbacks um, suggest that that's not the case. Okay, so that's the second thing, right? Uh, it's an ethical problem that has to be addressed urgently, and the way to do that is through mitigation, uh, which brings me to the third uh, idea I want to try to motivate and argue for. Um, I sort of got beat to the punch on this one, too. Um, uh, which is that uh, um, mitigation, adequate mitigation approaches are going to need to be both technological and behavioral and cultural. Um, so this is a, a graphic also from the um, 2007 interview <coughs> of the middle panel on the climate change report. Uh, that's interesting in a number of respects. Uh, it refers to some of the things that were talked about earlier. Um, it's about the sources of greenhouse gas emissions. The energy intensity is the amount of energy um, uh, that's used per unit of economic activity. Okay. Um, this is efficiency in economic activity. And as we can see, we've been getting better and better at this. We've had efficiency gains. Okay. And this is a downward pressure on emissions. So from an e efficiency perspective, we've been doing better and we're projected to do better in the future. Uh, the blue here, carbon intensity, is the amount of carbon emissions per unit of energy. Um, and in the past, um, that has also had a somewhat downward pressure on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that is, the amount of our, our energy supply has had fewer emissions per unit of energy. But as we saw in the previous slide, what's, what's happening with our energy supply? Right, dramatically broken. Okay. But per unit of energy, it's going down. Um, all right, so that's the downward pressures, and, and what would be great, right, what would be great is if we discover an inexpensive, abundant, um, uh, low emission energy that can be used across all sorts of, of platforms of activities, right? Then we get this really big, deep blue down here in the future, right? That's your, that's your miracle energy. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, so it's about to be great, but let's talk about um, what's up here, uh, population and... Um, income, right? So what's driving the increases in greenhouse gas emissions? The one thing that's driving the increase is population growth, right? More people, saw that last time. And then the other thing is uh, income per capita, that is economic activity per person, which translates on a kind of personal level to consumption, right? Consuming resources. So when we look at, in the past, what's led to the increases in, in emissions, it's what? Population and increased consumption. When we look at the future projections, what's it projected to be the source? Population. Yeah, not a trick question, right? Uh, population increased consumption. 
Uh, so if we're going to mitigate seriously, we have to get after that, it seems to me. Um, and that means um, uh, uh, behavioral changes, changes in consumption patterns, changes in population patterns and population growth rates. Okay. Uh, so I'm not the first to notice this. Um, people have suggested different ways in which we might do this. And so what I'm going to do here, this is the last thing I'm going to do, is run through some possibilities. I do not endorse all of these possibilities. We can talk about them in more detail during the discussion if you'd you like. Um, but these are the kinds of things that we might do on a behavioral or cultural level. One is, re with respect to uh, population, is reducing fertility rates. Okay? Um, and it turns out that there's a lot of ways in which you can effectively drive down fertility rate rates non-coercively. Right? We want to do this without coercion, right? without strict limits or <coughs> Uh, so, um, so here's some of them. Okay. Um, educational opportunities, education for women, and opportunities for civic uh, uh, involvement drives down fertility rates. Right? There's a very strong correlation between primary and secondary education um, in nations and the number of children per, per woman. Okay. Access to health care, particularly when it drives down infant and child mortality rates, is correlated with a drop in the fertility rate. Family planning availability uh, leads to driving down fertility rates. Okay, so there's quite a lot of things that might be done to do this. Again, these are just things to think about, um, but uh, what's not okay. Here's another one people sometimes don't like. Uh, eating less farmed meat. So it turns out that somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of greenhouse gas emissions are from agriculture. And of those emissions, 80% are associated with animal agriculture in particular. And the reason is that animals um, produce methane. Um, so there's, uh, there's emissions associated with the animals, that's one thing. But the other thing is that it's actually highly inefficient to take calories and nutrition, put it into an animal, where the animal uses, all, uses it for all kinds of things like walking around. Uh, and then taking the calories out at the end, right? You get less out than you put in. So that means you actually have to do quite a lot more crop agriculture and other things at the beginning. Um, and so people have thought, um, well, look, maybe we can significantly reduce emissions associated with agriculture if we just eat less of this um, farmed, farmed meat. And there's policies that might be pursued for trying to do that. Uh, agricultural subsidies could be um, put into place to try to encourage less meat eating rather than more meat eating. Uh, labeling, some people have thought on carbon footprints, and also we could use social programs to try to uh, generate new models and norms, right? The school lunch program, for example, which reaches quite, quite a lot of students. Here's another one. Reducing carbon intensive transportation use. This is what I imagine is gonna come up later in this um, series as well. Um, so one way to do this might be by decreasing elective flying. Flying has really high emissions, right? And one way to do that might be by internalizing carbon costs. And the EU suggested that we do this um, with a, a little tax that would be put on flights coming in and out of the EU. Um, but I think it got stopped. Is that right? Yeah, it got stopped because there was pushback. But the idea was, look, let's internalize the carbon costs and maybe this will have an effect on the um, number of elective flights. And also increasing public transportation use, decreasing carbon. Nothing new there. Uh, another idea people have suggested is a luxury consumption carbon tax. So the idea here is that um, we don't want to increase the cost of basic goods and services that people need, right? People, people need just uh, for minimally decent life, right? But we should progressively tax consumption above that, um, associated with, uh, related to how much carbon is involved in the global consumption. Um, and then another idea that's actually being implemented during the, uh, uh, under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, reducing deforestation. Right? Deforestation is another source of emissions. Um, maybe we can encourage less deforestation through um, incentive programs. Um, some people suggested debt for nature swaps, which is where developing countries would agree to not uh, to protect forests uh, in exchange for um, forgiveness of some of their natural <coughs> debt and creation of parks and reserves more generally. But again, this is like a this is like a what do you call it? A bunch of shots. Yeah. of ideas associated with behavioral wedges that are things to consider in addition to the technological innovations that we are undoubtedly going to need. Okay, uh, so let me just um, conclude by reiterating what I
sort of tried to motivate and argue for. Um, the first is that it's really crucial to see global climate change as an ethical problem. Uh, it adds uh, urgency to the problem, and it, it, can, it informs the sorts of solutions that are appropriate. Uh, the second um, is that when we see the types of values that are at stake and the options available to us, aggressive immediate mitigation seems by far the ethically preferable way to go. Um, and then uh, the last point, which is when we look at where the growth in emissions is expected to occur, uh, it seems clear that we're going to need both technological and behavioral or cultural uh, mitigation strategies in and again, in a quite aggressive way. Okay. So that's it. Um, look forward to your comments and questions.